In this video, we're going to be talking about the history of life on Earth. The first thing to know is that the early Earth conditions were very different than what it is today. So most scientists will agree that Earth is about 4.5 to 4.6 billion years old. One thing that's important to note is that there was no oxygen gas in the atmosphere until about 2 billion years ago. There were some gases in the atmosphere like carbon dioxide, ammonia, water vapor, methane gas, but there was no oxygen gas yet. That didn't come around until after life had already started because it was actually the first photosynthetic bacteria around. They were the ones who added the oxygen to the Earth's atmosphere. Here we're looking at a schematic of what we call the geologic time scale. It's important to note that up until about 550 million years ago, we just referred to that time as Precambrian time. That name comes from the fact that the first epoch of the Paleozoic era is called the Cambrian period, so everything before that we just call Precambrian. It was during the Cambrian period that we have what we call the Cambrian explosion or an explosion of life. So there was life around during the pre-Cambrian time. This is when we saw the first prokaryotes, even the first eukaryotes. But it wasn't until the Cambrian explosion that we really saw a bunch of life, animals and plants, start to evolve. Throughout history, there have been five known mass extinction events. What's important about these extinction events is that it allows new organisms to diversify. So for example, the extinction event that you're probably most familiar with is the KT extinction or the Cretaceous tertiary. This was the one that killed the dinosaurs. And so before that point, we were living in what was called the time of the reptiles or the time of the dinosaurs. And then it was during this extinction event that some of the smaller mammals, they were able to burrow underground and they were able to survive the extinction event. And so when they came back out from under the ground, there were no more dinosaurs preying on them. And so they they were able to diversify, and so that's why we are currently living in what we call the time of the mammals. So before we could actually have life evolve, we had to have what we refer to as chemical evolution or the evolution of things like DNA and amino acids. And so it was in the early 20th century that a scientist named Alexander Oparin, he was a Russian scientist, he suggested that life sort of bubbled up from what he called a primordial soup. That's about as far as he got. He didn't actually put any experiments to the test, but he suggested that life began from what he called primordial soup. It wasn't until 1953 that two scientists put this theory to the test. So one thing to also keep in mind, guys, is that 1953 was a pretty pivotal year in biology. It was the same year that Hershey and Chase conducted their experiments using bacteriophages to figure out that it was DNA and not protein that was the transforming principle or the genetic material. It was also the year that Watson and Crick published their publication about the DNA double helix. So all of this was happening at the same time. And these two guys named Miller Urey, they made this apparatus that's shown here that mimicked the early earth conditions and what they showed is that it was possible to create organic compounds such as amino acids and nucleotides using only the uh, conditions that were present in early earth. This diagram by the way can be found on the back of your unit 8 learning target so if you want to go and refer to there you can. So here's essentially what they did. They had this setup and they were trying to mimic the early earth conditions. So what they did is they took a heat source because there were heat sources back in early earth such as um, geothermal vents and volcanoes and then they had a an area that represented the ocean so they had some water that began to evaporate up through this tube and when that water vapor mixed with the other gases that were present in the atmosphere in early earth such as ammonia and methane gas they were able Able to add a little jolt of electricity using electrodes, the simulated lightning in the early earth conditions, what they were able to create is they actually made some amino acids, which then came down through here and they were able to collect in a beaker. So they were able to prove that yes, it is absolutely possible for molecules such as amino acids and DNA or RNA, which was DNA's predecessor, to evolve under the conditions of early earth. The thing that's important to note is that in the atmosphere bulb right here, there was no oxygen gas. They didn't include oxygen gas because there wasn't oxygen gas in the early atmosphere. That didn't come around until prokaryotes began to evolve. So when did life actually evolve? 
The first prokaryotes appeared approximately three and a half billion years ago. Now, if you're wondering how the heck did they figure that out, they actually have fossils that show that these bacteria lived in the early earth conditions. These rocks over here on the right side, these are called stromatolites. They're found in Australia, and basically what they are are fossilized bacterial colonies that lived three and a half billion years ago. These first prokaryotes were called cyanobacteria, and they carried out photosynthesis. They changed the earth by adding oxygen to the atmosphere. There was no oxygen prior to them living in the atmosphere, which means that we could not have evolved unless these guys were here before us to oxygenate the atmosphere. The first eukaryotes evolved about one and a half billion years ago. The first eukaryotes were single-celled, kind of like prokaryotes. They were just sort of a more complex extension of those guys. Later on, eukaryotic organisms started to become multicellular, and over time, things like plants and animal and fungi began to evolve. So, in this last section of notes, there are two important things. The first is that Miller-Urey experiment from a couple slides ago. That's an important experiment that showed that DNA and amino acids could be synthesized using only the conditions found on early Earth. This right here, this is the second important thing. It is what we call the endosymbiont theory. Endosymbiosis is a relationship in which one organism lives completely within the body of another. We can actually see this in our own bodies. You have bacteria that live in your large intestine and help to break down the food that you cannot digest. And those guys, those are an example of endosymbiosis. They live completely within us. And then from there, it's a symbiotic relationship. It's an example of what we call mutualism. They help us by digesting their food. We help them by giving them a nice warm place to live. So, this endosymbiont theory came from this woman named Lynn Margulis. This was in the 1970s, by the way. She was actually married at one point to a guy named Carl Sagan. You might know him from the show Cosmos. The show Cosmos that was on Netflix a few years ago, it was done by Neil deGrasse Tyson. But Neil deGrasse Tyson's predecessor is a man named Carl Sagan. He's a really famous physicist and astronomer. So she was actually married to this guy at one point. Very smart couple. So Lynn Margulis, she proposes that this early kind of eukaryotic cell, like it's starting to get a nucleus, but it's not officially quite a eukaryote yet, but she thinks that this early cell engulfed a bacterium and that that bacterium, rather than just immediately breaking it down for energy, that this cell realized, hey, this bacterium is making ATP for me. I should keep it around. And over many generation, this generations, this bacteria eventually evolved into mitochondria. She thinks the same thing happened with chloroplast, except that it was a cell that engulfed a bacterial cell that was making glucose for it. And so it decided to keep it around. So over many generations, that became chloroplasts. So she has quite a bit of evidence to support this theory. Both mitochondria and chloroplasts, the thing that they have in common is that they're very similar to prokaryotes. Both of them have their own DNA separate from what we call nuclear DNA found in the nucleus. They also have their own ribosomes, which means that both mitochondria and chloroplasts, they can each make their own proteins without using the uh, DNA that's found in the nucleus of the cell. Both mitochondria and chloroplasts, they can replicate themselves within a cell, much like a prokaryote would replicate itself. They're about the same size as prokaryotic cells. And on top of that, prokaryotes have what we call a circular chromosome. Our DNA is linear. It has a starting point and an ending point, but the DNA inside a prokaryote is circular. The DNA inside mitochondria and chloroplasts is also circular. So she had several reasons for thinking this. This is what we call the endosymbiont theory, and it's that we think that both mitochondria and chloroplasts, they evolved from prokaryotes that got engulfed by early eukaryotes. So that's it for the history of life notes. Pretty short and sweet. Be sure that you know um, the endosymbiont theory and the Miller-Urey experiment. Those are the two most important things from the notes. Uh, for right now, you have a History of Life Skyward question set that's due tomorrow at 11.59 p.m. So if you have extra time right now, you can go ahead and start working on those.